was only really small, about the size of a pea. So I went to the local doctor and told them about this lump. And because I was only 26, he said, oh, no, no, don't worry about it, it's hormones. And you've probably been to the doctors yourself and with other things, and they say it's hormones, you know, acne is hormones, everything's hormones. So um, he sort of reassured me that it would just disappear or whatever. And a couple of weeks after that, there was this discharge that was coming out of it, which was like... Um, Mum and I went shopping for a bra. Um, we went in and got a fitting for a bra, and Mum was helping me with it. And um, while she was helping me get the bra on, she brushed against the lump and said, oh, my God, what's that? And I said, oh, it was hormonal, not to worry about it. And um, by then, it was 12 centimetres big, and, like, not millimetres, but centimetres. It sort of started from the small pea-sized lump here, but by then it was sort of went round there, right around the outside, and you could, like, cup it in your hand. It was so big. Um, and she said then to go and see someone about it. So I went back there, and the doctor said, you know, not to worry about it still, even though there was, like, a pussy discharge and a bloody discharge. They said to just put some hot towels in the microwave and um, put them on your boob and express it all away. So I did. I went home and expressed it all away, like they said. And by the end of the night, there was just, like, blood pouring out of it, like red, raw blood. Yeah. And May of last year, I was just going for a routine checkup with the surgeon who would then look after me for the rest of my life. They do things like CAT scans and blood tests and things like that. And the CAT scan showed up that the liver was just covered with um, cancer cells. And it worked out that because the tumour had been so large and had sat there for so long, it had gone through to the lymphatic system. Uh, well, I don't think I've actually given up any fight. I'm, I'd still be quite happy to live for another 50 years or something. So uh, it's, it's not as if I've just given up. There's still a few things that I do that, to try and help myself. But um, no, I wouldn't say that I've ever given up. For five years, Deb Mabry has been living with a death sentence, misdiagnosed by doctors. Her body now riddled with cancer. With remarkable courage, she's beaten the odds, determined to live a normal life for as long as she can. And that's just included squeezing in a trip to Bali in the few months she's been given to live. My plan is to continue to have nine cycles of treatment, see where we are at the end of nine cycles. If things seem to be OK, we stop. Give you a rest. OK, like no cells at all left in my liver. That would be very well, unlikely. We'll just, no, we'll just see how things go. There may be a bit left there. When are you going to let it grow again? Well, I suppose there comes a question of, of how long we're going to keep going with the chemo. And you've been having a lot of chemotherapy for a while now. And I think, you know, your quality of life is an important issue. Don't you worry about that. <laughs> <laughs> at least it's a life. At least I'm not dead yet. <laughs> Well, I'm concerned about your quality of life. Don't worry about it. Just leave that to me. <laughs> I can cope with that. Well, well my guess is we'd stop after nine. And then what? Then we'd see how things go. And you Give don't, you a rest. Don't send me home to die, because I don't no, do no, that. No, 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 we aren't <laughs> going to do that. Well, so I'm not going to die yet. <laughs> Hi, Sam. Hi. Hi. Nice to see you today. Hi. Put some friends along. <laughs> Climb over. Thanks. Bye. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sit down and put your seatbelt on. Seatbelt, Sammy. Reach over and grab it. Good move. Pull hard. Good girl. Did you have a nice day? Oh, my God, it's a Oh, more parcels. No, not parcels. Oh, an Easter picture. Wow, Easter that's nice. Oh, good one. Oh, Neil. Boy one for Neil. And a girl one for Zoe. And a girl one for Sam.
Deb was pregnant with her third child, Sam, when finally she was told she had advanced breast cancer. The baby induced early, Deb underwent a radical mastectomy, reconstruction and a series of intensive chemotherapy. Throughout the ordeal, determined to spend as much time as possible with Sam and her other children, Zoe, age seven, and Neil, nine. Easter Bunny's here. Can we have a round one? Zoe, ask the Easter Bunny to show us how he pops. <laughs> <laughs> one thing I say to myself is, I'm really glad it's me, not my children. I'm glad it's me that's got cancer, not them, because at least I know that I can put up with the chemo and I can handle the tests and I'll do as much as I can. Whereas if it's a child, you don't know if they're just going to turn around and spit the dummy out one day and say, no, no more. So at least I know I'm in control. So I, I thank, I'm thankful that it's me, not my kids. And I really would hate to see my kids die. And then when I say that, I think, well, I suppose mum and dad must feel like that too. They must sit back and think, well, why couldn't it be us? Why does it have to be her? And so it's a really, it messes everything up. Everything gets really muddled. No one thinks straight anymore. Everyone gets emotional and, and everyone turns into real fruitcakes, really. Like people cry at the drop of a hat. You just have to be sitting, eating dinner with them and say the wrong thing and mum will just go, and <laughs> all her eyes will swell up and she'll run off. And yeah, so it's ruined a whole family, a big ex extended family. It's hard, bloody hard. It's very hard when you sort of look at it, look at her and think, you know, she may not be there tomorrow. But um, it is, it is draining, and it's been going on for a long time now. It was Mother's Day last year, and she was diagnosed, and uh, she's been on chemo for virtually 12 months. And that's what she was saying the other day that no one else really has been on chemo for that long. She's fighting it, and, and uh, that's what we've got to get through to other people. It's a new, he's got a new one. Okay, yeah, good. New restaurant there. Yeah. Don't hold me. Okay. Good day. For Father Ralph, mother, Lorraine, and sister Michelle, like Deb, fighting the cancer has consumed their lives. Debbie, the uh, jungle juice, huh? Have you had it today? Well, they had it since no, lunchtime? No. Okay, tell him all that one. No, 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 no. <laughs> Yeah, that's about 30 mil, that's about 100 mil. Yuck. It's just what some Aboriginals make up the back of whoop whoop. And um, it tastes like swampy water. And it's supposed to help people with cancer. Like one guy, his wife had cancer and it was supposed to have cured her cancers. <laughs> supposed to make your hair grow. Don't pull a face, Deborah. Oh, you're supposed to enjoy it. One of the reasons I'm taking it is because maybe, you know, I'd be cheating myself if there is something there. Maybe I should try it and just see what happens. Truth. Um, and it doesn't taste that bad. Like, I can oh, tolerate three right. glasses of muddy water a day. <laughs> okay. Oh, damn. Gone. Oh. <laughs> Today they're taking blood out of an infuser port. Okay. Which is under here. And it goes into what artery, what vein? It goes into the central venous line. Yeah. Blood tests every three weeks um, to determine blood levels for chemo. Uh, because chemo kills off fast growing cells, it also kills off red cells and white cells and to make sure that your blood levels are at an okay level before they blast you again with chemo, they do a blood test to determine that your haemoglobin is high enough, which is your red cells, and that your white cells are high enough, which are to fight infection. And also they have a look at liver enzymes because the liver's where the secondaries are. The liver's job is to make enzymes and if the enzyme levels are really high, it means that something's not quite right. So they have to be within a normal range. And I'm so brave. I don't even cry. Yeah, she's Ooh. very good. You okay there with the pillows? Yep. Okay. I'm so just gonna put the needle. Show them the size of the needle. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
Right. This is the stage where we have to hold her hand because she's a big baby. All right. Mm -hmm. So he just feeds us into your port and just go down to his. How was the holiday? Wonderful. How long, long did, did you go for? Barley belly? No. Sorry. This will be your worst one there because it's on TV. <laughs> Finished? Okay, that's oh, It was WA's southwest where Deb spent most of her married years, and here, where this student nurse was misdiagnosed by three doctors, two of them women. I Tell me hate then. those people. I really hate them. When I first found out what they'd done and the statistics and stuff like that, and I used to sit there at night and just think, I hate you people so much. How can I get back at you? And there's nothing I can do to make them aware of how I feel or make, put them in the same position. There's nothing. It's just pure negligence that should never, ever have happened. Deb sued the doctors. The case settled out of court. One of the conditions of the settlement that the doctors would not be named. Sharing Deb's bitterness, ex-husband Paul. The marriage breakup coming after the first round of chemotherapy. If there was one thing that you could change about your time with Deb and the kids, what would that be? Uh, the very first time Deb went to the doctor, I suppose looking back now, insisting that uh, she had a second opinion. Is, uh, you usually got trust in your family doctor and um, that uh, really destroyed all my trust in any doctors. When I realised that it was actually cancer the whole time that they were telling me it was hormones, I got really angry and I thought that they'd obviously cheated my children from having a mother. If I think too deeply, then I get upset. <laughs> um, now I just, sometimes I try and think, oh, won't it be nice if it all goes away? <laughs> but no, I do hope, sometimes I hope that those doctors down there see some of this and realise just what they've done to a family. Can I have the Ativan before the Finergan? Yes. Because otherwise we don't. Oh. What we give her, we just call the pre-medication. That's just the name we have on them. And um, and then we just give them all through the giving set and she just gets them all and gets gets a little tablet beforehand because she gets quite nervous. Mm -hmm. Go on. Stab away. And um, we usually do this first and then take her down to intensive care. Yeah, we're in. Okay, just flush that down there. That's just saline, isn't it? Yeah, just salty water. The same as what's in the drip. Mm -hmm. And as I said, she gets restless, so you've got to make sure it's yeah. well supported. I don't think I get that restless that I rip it out. Oh, you never know. What Thanks about nice. all the pre med stuff? Yeah, that's, they're just delivering it off. Oh, are they? Okay. So when it's all ready, we start. Shall I have the Ativan now? Yes, I can. Thank you, Ness. <laughs> just checking. You do a lot of that, don't you? Just I do. <laughs> oh, yeah. Just making sure. Do you find that you're a little bit more suspicious because of what you've been through? Oh, yeah, yeah. I check out, when I go to the doctors, I double check like their results and stuff like that. I usually look over their shoulder and just make sure that that's right. Or occasionally I'll just grab the file, or ask for the file, and just read through their file or the hospital file. And, but um, yeah, I think I've surprised them on a few occasions. When I came in last May, they were um, saying to Mum and Dad and Michelle, 
um, that there's not much more we can do for her. It's only a matter of time now before she ends up going into kidney failure and liver failure. And so I had this like 24 hour vigil while my bedside of family and stuff. And I was, they just filled me full of morphine. So I didn't really know what was going on. <laughs> And you're the sort of person that's a bit of a fighter. You're a bit of a larrikin. I know, a bit of a fighter, but yeah. Well, I think when you've got young kids, you have to. You can't just accept it and just wait and roll over and die. Oh, come in. Hi. Hi, Michelle. How are you? Good. Cakes. Good morning, Steve. <laughs> She's my only sister there. I know other brothers or sisters. So I'm still quite straight. So if there's any important things you want to ask me about the kids' school or anything like that, Ask me now before I forget I've got children or anything. <laughs> Just the thought that she could be taken away at such a young age and with children, and you just sort of think it can't happen. You know, you can't. I can't lose my sister when I'm only in my 30s. You know, that's supposed to happen in our 60s. You know, we're supposed to sort of give each other advice, and then I thought I can't lose her. Who's going to be there to sort of give me advice, and then I'll sort of give her advice? So no, it's not something I really want to happen, or even sort of contemplate that it will happen. Excuse me. Here we go. Whoops, I'm oh, straight. <laughs> no, you're not. <laughs> so watch where we're going. Huh? You alright? Fine. <laughs> okay. Should we catch this one? Yes, please. Yeah. We can get that later. No, it's got everything else. Yep. Okay, this time. Number four, yeah. Oh. Right? Are you okay? Uh -huh. Yeah. <laughs> Your designs have gone a bit slow. How have they? Yeah. They roll around in my head, yeah. Like you've been out drinking. <laughs> What it does is it travels around your bloodstream and picks up any fast-growing cells and kills them. Um, and there's, that's why you get the side effects because some of your fast-growing cells are red cells for your um, haemoglobin or oxygen carrying. The other cells that are fast-growing are white cells, which fights infection, so it's killing off them. And other things like hair, it's a fast-growing cell, so that's why that falls out. And inside your mouth, they're fast-growing. You get a lot of ulcers and things like that. So it's just going around killing off every fast-growing cell in your body. For the blankets? Yeah, the blankets. Get rid of this thing. When it's your patients, you do have a lot of compassion and empathy for them. And you'll often think about them when you go home, but at some stage it fades away. When it's your own child, it doesn't go away. And sometimes I'd find myself trying to be quite objective, but I couldn't be. And so you'd get quite embroiled in it but always for her I needed it to look very positive but deep down I had great fears because the few patients that I'd nursed that had had mastectomies and been diagnosed by it while they were pregnant had all died within six months of diagnosis and that kept playing on my mind. <laughs> Hello. Hi. Oh, Sam, what have you got? Mm -hmm. I think it's a 
have a do you want to have up here and we'll have a look? Yeah. You want one? Did you make yeah. this, Mummy? Mummy wanna have one. Oh yeah. You made that? Yep. Yeah. And I made the white one. That? Yep, the little thick one. What happened to this one? Did you eat the rest of that one? No. Um, the teacher broke me in half so we can have some in the bowl for um, Joshua's birthday. You so. still got your Easter bonnet from the hat parade on today that Mummy yeah. made this morning? Did everybody like that? Oh, it's a birdie. See? Colours. Did you make the basket too? Yeah. Very clever. Oh, and two big Easter eggs. Oh, thank you, Sam. If I get a kiss? Please, for Easter. Yeah. What you can put up with and also smile. It's, it's amazing what she's... When she goes in for chemo, it just about kills her, and yet um, within a week she's up bubbling and um, power walking and trying to fight this confounded thing off. You'd be cheating yourself from reality by saying that, oh, it's okay, everything's going to get better. You'd just be living in a dream world. You've got to face, you've got to, at one stage, you've got to come to terms with it and say, yeah, I am dying. Um, you've, that's just reality. But you don't have to, once you've done that, you don't have to walk around and say to everybody, I'm dying, I'm going to die next month, you know. Isn't it terrible? I am just exhausted, I'm so tired. But... You can't admit that to mum and dad because they'll be thinking, oh, she's tired, how are her eyes? Are her eyes clear? Oh, she's getting sick. Oh, no, what are we going to do? So, yeah, I am extremely tired, but you've just got to keep making out that, like, oh, the treatment must be working because I'm feeling great and stuff like that. You've got to give them a bit of hope just to make their lives OK. So do you really have hope then? I mean... No. <laughs> no. Can I the lady one? Now. Tell me how breakfast. Breakfast on toast. Breakfast on toast. On the table? She still is. Look at you. Sam is four and a half, nearly five. She's very independent, I think, mainly because she's had to bring herself up. Because um, when she was a baby and I was sick having chemo, she did all of the work herself. And so she's an extrovert and quite capable and she'll grow up and be a feminist or something and go around and probably hate men. And <laughs> yeah, no, she's OK, though. She's a, she'll be a survivor. And then you've got Zoe, who's seven, She's not quiet and she's not shy. She's very loud and outgoing and extrovert. And, uh, if it doesn't affect Zoe, well, it doesn't really concern her. <laughs> and Neil, who's nine, um, comes across as being very shy. He's a lot like his dad, doesn't show his emotions much. But if you hammer him enough, he will. Like if you delve in deep enough and spend the time, he'll tell you exactly how he feels. Um, he was a real homely little kid before I started going to school. He was a real sweetie, but then he turned into a typical little boy. See, that's it. Oh, thank you. Lovely. Yeah. Yeah. Beauty. Can I stop it? Sorry. Yeah. Give me back. Mm. Yeah, I was pretty disappointed because um, it was something I wanted to do for a long time. And the further into the course that I got, I was in my fourth semester, so further in I got, the more the chemo interfered with it and the tiredness and nausea and all that. I want to defer. I think I filled out the right form. Um, and also um, realising, even though I was saying to myself, once I get better, I'll keep on doing it, or, you know, I'll get back into it. But it's sort of like reality, you know that you won't ever get back there. Um, so it's really hard to know that you won't achieve your ambition, the career that you had in mind. Or the goals that you set for yourself that you won't ever reach them. Thank you. Any chance of breathing? 
pregnant? No. <laughs> Is this, anything to do, this is nothing to do with workers' compensation no, or motor vehicle? No, no, no. Okay. Have you ever had any brain surgery in no. your life? Just to double check now. Haven't had a craniotomy? No. <laughs> Haven't had any bleeding blood vessels in your head that doctors asked no. you to put a... Sorry, the doctors put a clip on to stop it bleeding. With your heart, have you had any surgery there? No. Do you have a pacemaker? No. You haven't had any valves replacements? No. Hi. 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 Yes. You press all the buttons? Right. You've uh, had this little scan previously. Yeah. Yep. 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 Remember how it all went? Yeah. Yeah. What we're going to do to start with is the. Um, when they talk the about people getting cancer under 25, they say it's a minority. We don't have the facilities to pick up. Mammograms won't work on them, but they're a minority, so we don't have to worry about them. But. You know, we're a, we are a worthwhile minority because we're wives, we're mothers, we're daughters, we're sisters. We've called a fair few jobs, and even though we're a minority, we're a really important minority. There's nothing worse than you finding a lump. Say you're 25, find a lump, go to your GP, and you say, oh, no, nothing to worry about. But you say, no, I've seen that thing on TV, I want a mammogram. You go to a mammogram, the mammogram's not going to work. None of the tests are going to be absolutely accurate. And you're going to sit around spinning out for another 12 months. And every time you brush against that lump, you'll think, oh, what's happening? It's getting bigger. And there's no need for anyone to go through anxiety like that. No other disease do you have to have so much anxiety. So you know what you do and go for it. <laughs> When my daughters grow up, you know, what state the country's in now with breast cancer research, there won't be a chance in hell for them either. You know, they'll obviously get it at a very young age, and the younger you are that you get it, the more aggressive uh, a type of cancer it is that you get. So by me doing this, maybe some politician might think twice about building another bridge for another third world country and think, well, that money maybe we should put towards really finding out what's behind all of this. OK. I've spoken to Swiven about the MR results, and he feels that the MR scan is slightly worse yeah. than before. Now, How much worse? Well, he said just a little bit worse. Now, before we go ahead and change your therapy on the basis of that scan, I want to see it myself. What would you change it to if it was worse? What, would you increase the dose or you'd stop no, the treatment? I, I don't what? see any. I don't see any role for a dose escalation. I don't think that would be appropriate. And what about a biopsy then? I don't think that that. Or the more anaesthetics you have, the worse it is. I don't think that's going to help us. No, but he can have a look around and see. Yeah, but I, I, I don't think that's going to... What's he going to see? You know, you've got to have a general anaesthetic for a start, so I don't think that's a good idea. And he's going to have a... And he's going to see a lumpy, bumpy liver. <laughs> and if the... if. But you weren't really... Were you expecting it to get better? I had hoped that the, that the MR scan would have been the same. I want like holding it at bay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I must say you seem remarkably calm for this news. Well, don't you think the last five years I've been expecting it? Well, no, maybe I've got brain damage. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's probably more likely. I think it's about time we got another chest x-ray too. Have you got time to have this today? Oh, yeah. OK. Well, no, I've got to be at a Mother's Day luncheon. Do you want me to go in there and tell them that you said I don't need half the pad, uh, that I need it done today? Yeah, if you just drop in, they should be able to do it pretty quickly. Okay. Will you make it to your Mother's Day lunch? I think I shall. Be able to fit that in. All right. I'll give you a call this afternoon. All right, what time, roughly? Oh, OK. <laughs> See you. 
Jerry Weiss or Paul Six or her mum or someone, I'd sit back and do nothing. Well, there's six in there waiting for that phone to ring. Yeah, well, we sort of knew that, didn't we? Yep, okay, so how much worse are they? Well, they're, what, three centimetres since the last MRI? That's pretty fast growing, isn't it? Oh, were they? So there's no more taxile then, because that's obviously not doing anything, is it? Okay, radio. Hang on, Mum wants. Mum's saying, "Can I talk to him? Can I talk to him? Do you want to talk to her?" <laughs> Hi, David. Um, obviously there are more lesions on her liver. Yeah. Were there any anywhere else? No. Oh, chest X-ray. And what did the chest X-ray show? Oh, okay. If there's a nice way to go, I think this would have to be one of the nice ways to go. That sounds a bit sick, I suppose, but I'm sitting here complaining about dying, and yet people have been murdered and tortured to death. People have been locked in boxes and chained and buried alive and burnt to death. They had some awful things happen to them, and I'm complaining about going in a nice, clean, hospital, dignified way. If there is a good way to go, I'd say it's a good way. Other people won't have been able to prepare themselves for their death because like, they'll be out there dying right now. You know, someone's husband's not going to come home tonight because he's been killed in a car accident or whatever. Will you be very brave when Sometimes I die? No. Yeah. Why not? Because I'll cry. Why? I'll be so sick, Zoe. You won't want me to stay alive when I'm that yeah. sick, will you? No, but I would still want you. You've got pictures of me. And the videos. But, but someone, someone might steal them. Well, we'll make lots of copies so that everybody's got a copy of the pictures and the videos. And then you won't need to cry, will you? No. You can cry a little bit. Yes. But there'll be lots of people to look after you, won't there? Yes, there will be Daddy. There'll be Aunt Shelley. Karen. And Grandma. And Granddad. Jeff. So you don't need to be sad. You can be sad, like if you hurt your leg, you're sad for a little while. You can be sad like that. And if, if you get really hurt? No, no, because I'll be very what sick. What if you have a broken leg? I don't know about that. But when you get really, really sick with cancer, sometimes it's nicer for people to be able to die and go to heaven, isn't it? Because it's nice there. I think it is, I don't know. It is. Can you write us a letter, Mummy? A letter mm -hmm. from heaven? Yeah. I don't know if they had pens and papers, Zoe. Why don't you bring that? Why don't you put one in your coffin? Okay. I'll come and talk to you when you have dreams. Shall I? How? Why? I don't know. It's a bit tricky, isn't it? Yeah. You just think of me, and that'll be like talking to me. Okay. Because I don't think I'll be able to write a letter. Because if there is some paper, can you write a letter? And but I don't think the postie goes up there, Zoe. No, but you can, you can just throw it down. Can I? Yes. Hi. I'll leave your letter before I die. Mummy! Mummy? Yeah. When I pray for you, um, can you say, hello, Zoe? I'll try. But it's a long way away. You might not be able to hear me. Why don't you come down? Big fairy. They might, oh, yeah, I'll come down, but I'll be so small when I'm a fairy, you won't be able to see me. Yeah, but we'll, and you'll be able to see where I'm sitting at school. I'll be able to see you, but you won't be able to see me, and I'll look after you. Yeah. I'll watch and make sure nothing happens. My biggest concerns would be for when my daughters grow up, hopefully what happened to me won't happen to them, 
and maybe by the time they are teenagers that they'll know a fair bit more about breast cancer so they won't ever be put in that position. Looking at my kids now, I sort of think what will become of them when they grow up. Also, the biggest concern is who will be their main influence in their lives, whether it be their father or my parents. Um, just what will, not being able to see them grow up and not seeing them get into relationships and not being there when they need you most. That's the hardest thing. Everything else is not easy when it comes to dying, but um, that's my biggest concern is what happens to the kids and I don't think I'll ever rest assured as to what becomes of them. I hope the people that are newly diagnosed and that are watching aren't in such a state now that they're thinking there's no hope for me, I'm going to die because I know so many people with breast cancer that are alive and have never had secondaries and will probably live a normal life but I hope by me doing this I'm not spinning out a whole heap of people by saying oh, look at me, it's going to happen to you next but you know I don't want that to happen, I want them to know that it's a, a possibility, keep it in mind so look after yourself once you've been diagnosed, do the right things, do your diet properly, don't have heaps of late nights, don't do wild parties anymore and don't stress out and um, just take care of yourself and you, you might be okay and more than likely you probably will but there will be an unfortunate few if politicians don't get up off their butt that will just keep dying and no one will be able to tell you who those people will be, not like any other disease that you get where they can say because you've got such and such hair, you're going to die. Breast cancer is, you know, we've cut out your tumour, but we can't tell you if you're going to be here or whether you're going to... The woman down the road had a tumour twice as big as you. But she's probably going to live 20 years, but, you know, yours is only little, but you might die to in 10 weeks' time. It's just so such a no-one-knows-anything disease. Um, what about advice to men? It's... It, do you have any advice to men of, of the partners of, of women with breast cancer? Yeah. <laughs> you have to put up with a fair bit. Uh. What sort of things? Just be supportive and put up with mood swings <laughs> and depression. And, and at times you'll think that the person's going crazy, but they're not. And don't look at other people's boobs. <laughs> and just, yeah, just make it feel normal. And help. You've got to help so much. And I think just being there, and, and if your wife knows that they're there, then you'll be OK. So it's not just a woman's disease, is it? No, not at all. It affects so many people. It's a disease. I, I suppose any disease affects... Oh, the community, but breast cancer, because it's such an emotional thing, people, husbands are worried about what their wives think about their bodies and wives are worried about what their husbands think about the wives' bodies and mothers are worried about their daughters and the fathers are worried about their daughters and the mothers are worried about their children. It's just like the whole family just gets so screwed up by it. Everyone, no one knows what to do. It's like Someone's dropped an atomic bomb in the middle of your lounge room and it's quick, make the most of it, let's fix it up, what are we going to do? It's, it's an everyone's disease. It'll affect everybody. It'd be nice to say, no, there's nothing new, like I feel great and all that, but um, I do feel tighter and I do feel more nauseous. The nausea is hard to work out whether that's from the chemo drugs whether it's part of the disease. But um, I did ask him what my death would be like, like what would happen. And he said that you'd just get more and more tired and eventually you'd just sleep more and more and then you just wouldn't wake up. He said there wouldn't be much pain and stuff like that, so. I get phone calls from people saying, you know, you give up too easy and stuff like that. But, you know, if there was any way that I could be alive for the next 10 years for my kids or the next 20 years, I'd do it. Like, even if it meant chopping off my right leg, I'd go out and do it. But um, no one's got anything that's going to work. No one's come up to me and said, try this, it's going to work. 
I've decided to write letters to the kids so that they've got a little bit of history about themselves um, and it's my only way that I know that the kids will get true history about who they are and where they came from and things like that. How long I was in labour and what they were like when they were born and maybe the name I was going to call them before I chose their name. And just little things like that that probably you ask your own mother. It is a hard thing to do, to write a letter to your kids, um, but I think everyone probably should do something like that, leave notes for people, because you never know when your time's going to be up. And there's so many people that die out there that don't have time to um, leave valuable information. One thing I was thinking of the other day was um, if I was going to get really sick and it would happen really quickly is um, hopefully that I wouldn't die like when there's just me and the kids around. Hopefully there'll be someone else. Well, as you've seen, a most remarkable woman. You know, one of the most frequent questions I'm asked is how are Deborah's children? Although they miss their mother terribly, Neil, Zoe and Samantha have found continuing love and happiness in the care of Deborah's parents, just as she had wished.